Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you have invited us this morning into your presence. And that because of you, your forgiveness, your love, your mercy, and the power displayed in your death and resurrection, you have made a way for us to be in your presence and know that in you we are received and made your sons and daughters. So, O oh Lord, as we come in, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to you, that you would form in us that which you desire. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's great to be back here at Good Shepherd Lake Wales. I have to tell you, I still remember my visit, now something like two years ago. Uh, the graciousness of the hospitality, the really fun conversations that I had with people, and this has been no exception. Uh, we were at the local bed and breakfast, Two Oaks, is that what it's called? Uh, people were great, and it's great to be here. So thank you very, very much. Uh, my wife and I feel profoundly and warmly welcome, and I say that to you because sometimes that's the case in some congregations, and sometimes it's not. Uh, you have a gift of hospitality, and I just want to thank you very, very much for it. You know, I do this a lot, going from church to church to church, doing confirmation service. And I have been asked, well, doesn't it get a little tiresome? Kind of boring? And, and I want to say to you, at least in this the third year of my Episcopacy, no, not at all. And here's the reason, twofold. One is, is that we are trafficking in this service in enormously important things. And I never fa fail to feel the enormity of what is being asked of people and the commitments that they are making, not only to us, meaning bishop and congregation, but also to God. As I said to the confirmation group before the service, this is a life commitment. It's not just an event and then you kind of move on. You've actually made a decision to take your life in a very, very specific direction. So I feel the enormity of that personally, not just for them, but it's also a reminder to me of the commitments that I made in my confirmation many years ago to follow and to lead in a very specific kind of way. And it, all of this, I think, can be summed up in the very last line. If you want to turn to this, in the epistle reading in 1 Thessalonians. Paul is telling people about his excitement about what's going on in the Thessalonian church. He's thrilled about what's going on. And when you read it, there's this kind of joyful elation in his voice. 1 Thessalonians is, in fact, the earliest of all of Paul's epistles. In fact, that letter goes back to the earliest life of the church. And so you get a real sense in reading that letter what first century Christianity really felt like. And what he's describing at the end is a conversion point. And it, I think it sets the tone for the whole rest of the letter. And for us, it sets the tone of what it actually means in our heart of hearts to be a Christian. And he says this, he says, For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how, here's the key phrases, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. I believe with all of my heart that that kind of turning is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And it never, we never ever get over it. In other words, we are always, if we're saying yes to Jesus, and the, the commitments that we made in baptism and confirmation are not just events and now we move on, but actually life commitments that set a course for us in terms of our life. We're always in the midst, in some way or another, of turning 
from something to someone, which is Christ. You see, that's the heart, the whole concept of repentance and conversion. Repentance actually means to turn. If you'll follow me for a minute, I'm going to go over here. Repentance is this. Repentance does not mean, oh, I'm going in this way of sin, and I'm going, oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh God, I'm so sorry. That's not repentance. That's contrition. You feel bad, but you're still doing it, right? <laughs> Nod your heads. Come on, we're in this. Yeah. <laughs> Repentance actually means you're going, ah, oh, this is really awful. I'm so sorry. And something happens in your life that causes you to do this and literally go in a different direction. It is that turning that is, in fact, the true meaning of the word repentance. And that's exactly why Paul uses the phrase, how you turn from idols to serve the living and true God. My point is, we're always turning. At some level or another, if we're saying yes to Jesus, we're facing up to, in many cases, the idols in our life, the false images that we have of ourselves, the priority that we give to other things over and above God. The things that we have to let go of that describe who we are but not who we want to become. Does any of that make sense? And that it takes a lifetime to do that. That I, I'm always on the hunt. Discovering new places, as at least in my life, where the temptations the perceptions are not the same as what Jesus would have for me. And that I have a choice to make in the midst of the expectation. Do I give in to the expectation that may not be what Jesus asks of me? Or do instead, do I turn and say yes to Christ to do the thing that he is asking of me? which may in fact be very, very different from what the expectation is. You see, I, I and, and that's hard. And it's also very, very subtle. The example is what happens in the Gospel reading. Here's the story briefly. Pharisees want to get rid of Jesus, and what they want to do is publicly discredit him. So they hatch a plot, and it is a plot. And so what happens is, you've got the Pharisees on the one hand, who are strict separatists. They want nothing to do with the occupational army of Rome, Caesar and the like. They consider them pagan and blasphemers, both of which are true, you see. And then you have the Herodians, that's another party within Judaism. They think the job is collaboration. So they want to work with Rome, whatever it takes. They're pragmatists, they are realists, and all this separatism doesn't work. So two very, very different groups of people. And it's a surprise to the Matthean reader who goes, Pharisees and Herodians don't have anything to do with each other, which they didn't. But they became allies in this effort to try to discredit Jesus. So they show up with, and say, ask the question, is it lawful to pay taxes? Meaning according to our law, our Mosaic law. Is it okay, in other words, for us Jews to pay taxes to Caesar? And so what does Jesus do? He says, okay, let me see the coin. So they pull out actually a fairly large coin that, was, that took actually represented quite a bit of money. And Jesus says, let me see the coin that you would use to pay the tax. So somebody has a denarius, and they pull it out, and he says, whose image is on it? And he says, Caesar's. Well, it's not only just Caesar's image. But on, in Latin, on the coin, it says, in English, the divine Caesar high priest. In other words, the coin makes a pagan declaration to the deity of Caesar. And they also say, as the deity, he is our high priest in all things that have to do with the deity. Which, of course, any Jew would consider absolute blasphemy. 
as would I would hope any Christians. And so they don't know what to do because for, for the Pharisee to actually even pay the tax, they consider blasphemy to their tradition and therefore they won't do it. The Herodians, no, no, we got to pay taxes and make, do the best we can. And what does Jesus say? He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to give to God the things that are God. It's an incredibly subtle message. But one that really strikes at the heart of this very turning process that I'm talking about. Because you see, we are always in the very dilemma that is going on with these Pharisees and the Herodians. Think about what it means to be a Christian in the society in which we live. There are some who really do operate as Pharisees. If we're going to be faithful to Jesus, what that means is, is that we need to literally cut out public life. Hang out with your family. Do the best you can with the people that you know and care about. Do your best to keep all of those pagan influences out, whether they're coming through the television or you name it. And try to raise up a generation and a group of people who know how to live separately and faithfully as Christ in the midst of our very non-Christian culture. They would be, in our day, Pharisees. Then there are the Herodians. Who are they? No, 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 no. The scripture calls us to be in the world and not of it. Which means our job is actually to be very involved in the institutions that run our society and do our best in the midst of that to try to make a difference. They would be the Herodians, you see, in 20th, 21st century United States. And what Jesus does is in fact call both to account. That neither position is complete. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, he says to the Pharisees, look, you can't create a fantasy land where the ruling authorities don't matter in your life. All it's going to do is get you in trouble. You've got to acknowledge that temporal authority. That is a part of your responsibility. So if we translate that into contemporary culture, for a Christian to say, I want nothing to do with politics, I'm going to block out the culture, it doesn't work. It seeps in any way. And in fact, because you're not paying attention to it, you get caught. You find yourself buying into cultural values that if you were more aware of the nuances of the culture, you would never ever buy into. You would be thinking more carefully about it. Whose companies are you willing to, in fact, support? And to be concerned about, well, if I'm going to turn around and pay taxes and vote in the elections, then I need to pay attention to what these candidates actually stand for. I need to play a role in other words. So the Pharisee separatist position is an incomplete position. Yes, there is the call to live in a way that is different from the prevailing culture. But that doesn't mean that we have the right to opt out. On the other hand, the temptation of the Herodians, and by contrast, most Episcopalians are Herodians. <laughs> we have, and it's part of our tradition, that sense that we actually have an obligation to the public and private institutions of our culture. And therefore, particularly if we are people of education, we want to make a difference. We want to get in there and roll our sleeves up. For us, the well-being of the community actually matters. Because this is where, whether it was, this is where I've been born and raised and where my generations have always been. And therefore, I want to make sure that my neighbors are taken care of because I might even be related to them. Or somebody who's moved here from another part of the country or even of the world. We have a sense that God didn't place us in Lake Wales, in this case, by accident. We actually live in Lake Wales by divine appointment. Even, it was, even if it was because that's where we were born. And therefore, I have a responsibility to the community in which I was placed to actually get in there and make a difference and be involved in the life of the community. But here's the temptation, and this was the temptation of the Herodians. I don't look any different than anybody else. In other words, I jettison the whole idea that somehow, what does it mean to live not of the world if I'm going to be in the world? And how do I do? Where do I draw the line between what is acceptable and what's not acceptable? If I'm going to pay the taxes of my time and my money and my efforts to make a difference in my world, when do I get so much like them that I'm actually no longer able to make a difference? Because we're all the same. I just happen to believe in Jesus in my heart. But in every other way, I look like everybody else. 
And that is, in fact, the pressure that is put on many Christians to make their Christian faith merely a private sentiment that has nothing to do with community service, public policy, or even <coughs> politics or education. So you can't go there. In other words, we're always in the position, if we're continuing to turn, both at a personal level as well as at the citizen level, say, what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? What were the expectations with which I was raised that in fact really don't look like Christian values at all, even though they were brought to me by my Christian parents? Where does what I believe actually line up with the scriptures and what the scripture teaches as opposed to what my culture teaches? And it's more and more of a tension because you see, we live in a culture right now that actually pays very little attention to Christian values. Right? Nod your head. Yes, we do. So it's actually more of a demand than it has been perhaps in less generations. But the opportunity is, is that it gives us greater clarity. We can speak with clarity because our voice is so different than other people's. Whether we're talking about political involvement, whether we're talking about issues of ethics, where we're talking about the role of religion and public life, or whether we're even talking about who Jesus is in comparison to other religious traditions. We take very different positions than many of the others around us. And if those other positions are not clothed in a life of love and generosity, we just come across as separatist legalists, even if we don't mean to, or Pharisees. Which is why, going back to the Thessalonian lesson, and then I'll be done. He says, how you turn to God from idols to do what? To serve. That's the key word. To serve. The Son of Man, if you remember Jesus said, came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So that, for example, you're not just merely concerned about the problem of homelessness. You're actually feeding the hungry. You're not just concerned about the issue of unwanted pregnancies. You're finding a way to serve people who are caught in the depth of that very dilemma. You're not just sort of concerned about the issue of gay marriage, but you're actually building relationships with gay people and learning how to care for them and love them as people made in the image of God. In other words, it's never hypothetical, ever. Now, you can't bear the weight of the whole world on your shoulders, so it has everything to do with, oh God, where do you want me to serve, again, if you were, in the midst of the many needs and opportunities that are out there, because it's out there where we are in fact called to serve. So you ask the Lord to show you what you need to do, but as you see him opening the doors, then out of that, you begin to find a place. And it changes you as well as you making a difference out there, as it's meant to. All of that is at the heart of the commitments that are being made at confirmation. So listen carefully. Even as you also say, we will... It's a reminder of the commitment all of us have made to continue to allow the turning to happen so that we become, by God's mercy, more and more servants of Jesus wherever we are. And as a result, make the kind of difference in the world that Jesus says is, is possible. Is it easy? No, it's actually really complicated. We need one another's help and prayers. We need to deliberate and wrestle together. But that's exactly what we're invited into. We're not doing this alone. We're having this as a public service because we're a part of a body that has made these commitments together. We will, we say. So with that in mind, I want to move into the confirmation service. But understand that these are your commitments this morning. In other words, what I'm not going to do is close the... Sermon with a prayer, and then we kind of move on and do something else. We're going to instead keep this and say, and, and let this inform the very liturgical commitments that we are about to make, as we're saying, hopefully in a deeper way, both yes to Jesus and yes to one another as his fellow servants. Amen.